little bit more than fruit. Okay, and the recording started. Uh, thank you, Lajidra, for starting that. Um, so we'll start with uh, with some quick um, uh, introductions. Um, so I'm Michael Hernandez from um, Just Text. Um, my my colleague Tim um, Walkenfeld is is joining me on this and. On the panel, um, helping us with this um, is uh, Charnel and Carlton. Um, so Charnel is a consultant, but has worked directly uh, with legal nonprofits um, in the past. And um, Carlton is working directly, uh, currently as an IT director for uh, legal nonprofit in Texas. And is Carlton very active on the LSNTAP um, listserv. So I'm sure if, if you've, uh, if you've read any of the postings, uh, emails that are on there, you've, you've definitely seen um, him respond to uh, questions that uh, have been posted. So um, he is on this call. Just nice sometimes to put a face to the name, especially someone that has been as, as active as, as he is. Um, so the, the topic uh, for today is uh, cybersecurity training for your staff. This is uh, everyone that's that's on the panel, um, and you know we're all e sort of easily accessible, um, you know, especially through uh, LSN Tap. So if, you know, if there's anything, you know, post uh, post this webinar that you would need, uh, you know, have questions for, would would you know like some additional information? I'm sure any any one of us would be more than happy to uh, you know to help answer whatever questions that you have. And okay, so some of the topics, uh, you know, that we're going to discuss. So why, why, why security awareness training? We're going to talk about the, you know, some of the methodologies, the frequency, you know, how to reinforce uh, supervision. Uh, talk, you know, uh, show a little bit about costs and implementation and onboarding, um, because uh, you know, cost is important on, uh, you know, and on if you're able to sort of do it or not. Um, so we, you know, thought, uh, you know, including some information on there would be helpful. And if time permits, there are some other areas outside of training um, that, you know, we just wanted to sort of touch on related to security uh, that we thought was, would, you know, be worthwhile uh, discussing. I'm going to leave up this slide for uh, you know for a sec. I think it has some you know some some useful information. I think um, you know especially the first one, right? Human error um, is involved in you know 90% of data breaches. I mean, I'm sure you know that number depending upon who you ask, um, you know, could go up, could go down some. But I think the the biggest sort of takeaway there is you could spend a lot of money on security and have different systems and policies in place to help secure your data. Um, but your users are the ones that, you know, are at sort of the biggest risk of um, allowing, you know, put un unintentionally, uh, you know, a breach. Um, so that's really where sort of the training comes into play and helping them, you know, sort of understand um, so, you know, how, how, how are these people trying to get my information and, and why and what are the different uh, methods that they use? Um, you know, education and knowledge is key. So if, if you have that information. Hey, Michael, you just muted yourself. Oh, that's weird. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, having that that knowledge of 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 how um, they're going to try is is going to help. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the 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 ways that um, they do things are getting more uh, sophisticated. They're very targeted. Um, you know, especially you know when they're using social engineering. Um, even uh, you know with you know to give you an example of how um, they work around systems is. If so, you know, in the past, if they would send you a link that was bad and you had a good, uh, you know, email security in place, uh, they would be able to, you know, they would know, okay, this is this is not a link that we want to sort of allow. And what they're doing now is uh, they'll send an email 
with a link that's to a legitimate place, they'll wait 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you know, whatever it is. And then on the back end, um, redirect that link. So the link where you that was going to originally take you now forwards you to another site. So what that does is it allows um, the email to get through and not blocked and then now um, on your computer. So then when you click on it, um, it then now really takes you to where they want. Um, so, you know, they're, you know, unfortunately, we're always, you know, one step behind, always one step ahead because they're, you know, figuring out ways to get through, uh, you know, all the, the security that's in place. So, this is where the training, you know, really comes into play and getting people to understand, you know, oh, someone sent me a fax. This is not what I normally see. Um, uh, I shouldn't have to enter in my my username and password for Office 365 to access, um, you know, something that is not on our system. Um, so, you know, understanding all of that um, is is important. And then go to the next uh, slide. Okay, so here, here's where um, uh, you know the the rest of the panel is really going to start sort of uh, uh, you know sort of pitching in. So, uh, Carlton, I'm going to sort of pick on you first in terms of the types of attempts that I have listed here. I mean, what what do you think you've tried to relate to staff most on, um, you know, what, what uh, you know, what type of attempt to look out for most from this list? I think the common theme in all these or most of these is um, there's usually a link inside the email and that's, you know, really getting trouble is they don't mouse over the link to find out where it's actually going to take them to just click on whatever they see. Um, that's part of the training is that um, it teaches you not to just, you know, just click on whatever you see in the email. You have to look at the, the link where it's going and then look at the email address. Who's it actually coming from? Is it is that really the executive director's email address or is that a misspelled version of the email address? Right. So, um, you know, uh, what Carlton's mentioning from this list um, in his example um, is, a, you know, a spear phishing or clone, right, where they're impersonating, uh, you know, someone that you know, work with. Um, a lot of the times, you know, unfortunately, they they're able to go to your website and see who's the executive director, who's the CFO, you know, who who the managers are, and then use that information to target you. So, you know, they they create a sense of urgency when they're sending emails uh, from from upper management, and you think, oh, you know, this is an important email. Let me act on it right away. Um, so what Carlton mentioned was, you know, training users to, you know, look, look, look at the email, scroll over and, and make sure it's actually coming from that individual. Um, you know, as, as easy as it is for them to, to uh, uh, you know, a spoof an, an email address, it, it is harder to, you know, uh, replicate the language that that person would normally use in an email. So that's you know definitely a, a telltale sign on um, you know is this something that this person would normally um, you know send me and and so that's aside from you know looking at if the email is actually from them by looking at the email address it came from that's you know that's another way um, you know to sort of uh, you know to help. Um, Charnel, um, when because you've you've you know recently had um, a security system implemented, could you um, talk a little bit about you know sort of why you thought that was important for the organization? Yeah, sure. Um, I do think uh, my first uh, deep dive really into cybersecurity needs for either clients or the previous organization I worked with was, I would say, more in 2019. Um, I'm based in New York, and so the New York Shield Act was uh, requiring all New York employers to be responsible and have certain types of safeguards in order to protect data and confidential information. Um, so since we transitioned uh, in 2020 into that remote format, it did create a new structure that needed to be implemented for that particular organization. 
Um, a lot of my clients and organizations were uh, quickly shifting from that full on-prem uh, format to remote work. And so simultaneously, the tech team had to really uh, make those adjustments and either really look into our existing processes and then uh, start creating new systems that we needed and connecting with new vendors and really launching that new tech. Uh, so it really was important for the staff to get trained on what this remote work would look like and uh, what type of either phishing attempts or things um, that could impact our work and uh, also making sure that they were getting trained on those new systems that we're putting in place. So, you know, we all know cyber attacks didn't slow down and uh, we just wanted to make sure all of our client data was being protected. That's great. That's great, Farnell. Um, so at the at the bottom here, um, you know. So I wanted to start of start off on. So why 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 um, think about doing uh, you know security training for staff? Um, and you know, the, so the, I've listed sort of the biggest reasons below in terms of what they're the the hackers are trying to attempt. Right. So they're trying to attempt to steal your credentials to access your data. You know, sometimes it's just to access your, your email to then send out additional phishing emails. Um, it could be ransomware. It could be to pay a fake invoice. Um, we've, you know, we've seen that. Um, it could be to change direct deposit information. I mean, that's that's been going on um, for years now as well. And I think um, this one's been going on for a while too, but, you know, I think a little bit more and play recently where you know they're they're trying to get staff to buy um, gift cards. So that's that's normally what I've seen. Well, um, you know, sort of the clone where you know it appears a manager um, is sending an email to to staff um, and and trying to get them to to purchase email. And we actually had one um, one uh, you know organization that we were helping with recently where. Unfortunately, uh, a staff person that was on the job three days um, fell fell victim um, to that. And you know, the executive director said, you know, so I feel like um, how how would they know um, that you know this person just started? I mean, how would they know to sort of target that that person? Like, I think her concern was, you know, was her her email compromised? Um, and um, I can't say 100% that this was the the cause but a quick you know sort of search of that staff member's name um you know was able to find their LinkedIn page and they had posted on LinkedIn that you know they were going to be starting at this organization you know in a week um and you know this is you know they were going to you know this is what they were going to be doing there so this is where the social engineering you know anything that you you post online you know, whether it's on the website, you know, the organization website, or your own personal website, they use that information, you know, to help you know narrow down sort of the the target. So, can I say 100% uh, certainty that that you know LinkedIn was the cope, you know, what sort of helped in this case? I can't, but more than likely that, or you know, if if he, the user had posted somewhere else. Um, that's, you know, how they were able to sort of target him, um, you know, so quickly from, from when starting. The submission for, for those that I think um, a lot of people sort of understand um, these, but the submission is actually um, text messages. Um, so you might receive a text message that's, um, you know, hey, you want a prize, click on this, or you know some other um, uh, uh, text that has a link in it. Oh, your your Amazon order was delayed. Um, you know, click on this link to to get details. And um, you know, most of the time, the the attempts are not ways that you would normally um, do business. So you know, that's that's a telltale sign there. You know, I don't normally get texts from Amazon. Um, you know, about a, a, a delayed order, you know, I normally get that via email. So yeah, I, I don't think this is legitimate. And, you know, my, my best advice um, for for any of these, you know, when in doubt, um, you know, look, 
look to to contact the source directly. And unfortunately, email is not a good um, way to 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 contact someone because if their account is compromised, the person who has access to that account is going to uh, be the one responding. So, but the phone is is typically the best uh, the best approach. Okay, so Carlton, um, I'm sure, so you've had uh, uh, know before, I've just called by name, um, installed um, at your organization for a number of years. Um, you know, there are a lot of ways to do staff training. Is there, you know, is there something that directed you to know before or an online training platform um, uh, that, you know, made you go that route versus other avenues? Actually, I, I found out about them at a uh, IT conference here in Austin called Spice World. Um, so I got a lot of information from them at their booth. Um, and then they also have a free assessment that you can take. So we did the assessment um, where they send out um, a phishing test. And I, we, I think we failed pretty miserably. I think we had a click-through rate of like 40%. The industry standard for uh, Nonprofit agencies, I believe, is like 34%. So um, that was kind of an eye opener for us. And that was uh, that was when I went to my manager and said, I think we need to go ahead and implement this. Great. Charnel, when when you were thinking about training for staff, were you thinking about live training um, as, as an option? Um, as far as live trainings, I do think having trainings physically either in the office or in person are beneficial because um, I think a lot of times folks do tend to ask more questions in person. Um, however, with COVID and uh, with implementation of a lot of these trainings in 2020, things had to be done online. Um, so the online presence did allow that flexibility for folks that were uh, either far away from uh, the office or decided to relocate uh, during the shutdown. Um, so I do think either training uh, is effective, um, but live trainings naturally are preferred because uh, you want that face-to-face -face, uh, communication with your staff should they have questions. Right. Yeah, the, the live training definitely has um, some, some benefits. Uh, I think the the challenge with only doing live training is, you know, that that training is happening there at that moment. I mean, yes, you 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 can you know you can record it, um, but you know, for the staff that missed that training, um, for the staff that you hire after that training, um, that you know, so that's that's the challenge I think you have with uh, with with live training and. You know those those the live trainings uh, can be very expensive, and if you happen to record that training, you know that that content gets stale, you know, somewhat quickly, right? So from year to year, you're going to end up, you know, sort of doing that live training again. It's it's the one time live, then you have the recording accessible. Um, so. I, I think the live, you know, the live training um, does, uh, you know, propose some benefits, um, but I, I don't think that's that's the only way, you know, um, you do it. I think the, you know, the online training, um, the advantages are right. The content, you know, there's, you know, depending upon the vendor that you pick, you know, they could have an extensive library. Um, you know, staff could take them at, you know, when when time permits for them. You're also able to monitor who's taken it, who hasn't. You know, some of the trainings are interactive, um, so you know there is a score that's kept. Um, so if if there was, you know, if, I, I think you know my recommendation is, uh, you know, if, if you're only going one way, um, you know, to do a training, the, I think the biggest advantages are the online training um, because of. Because, you know, because of all the, the added um, benefits and value that 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 brings. Um, most uh, so most platforms um, that do the online trainings also allow you to do um, fake phishing tests. 
Um, and, and then there are some platforms that that's all they do. Um, they'll just do a fake phishing test. And, and what, you know, for those that, you know, might not be familiar, um, a fake phishing test is where you send out an email to staff, you know, you're using a bogus um, address and you're making it appear as if it's a legitimate email and it's it's seeing you know how far you go with the email do you open the email do you click on the email uh, do you click on the link in the email uh, do you enter in any credentials um you know to you know your username your password it wants to see how far you go and then reports that information back and what that does is it, it allows the organization to know okay well you know we just sent this email out to staff and you know, X amount of people, you know, if this was a real phishing attest, they, they, you know, attempt, they would have failed. So the, the fake phishing tests um, are helpful um, in that way to give the organization a sense of, okay, you know, who's, who's you know, really um, paying attention to the emails coming in and not falling for this stuff and who needs training. And a lot of the platforms, what they'll do is if you fall for it, um, then they'll you know they'll make you take a like a refresher training or uh you know or or a training you know specifically you know in the areas of of uh concern so the the fake phishing tests again um there's organ there's companies that that that's all that they do they don't do the other um you know sort of uh trainings um so you know if if you don't have an online or if you don't have a training platform in place um, and it's something that you can't do. I, I definitely look to see um, about you know uh, you know working with someone that could do the fake uh, phishing test to kind of just give you a sense of uh, you know where your staff are uh, with that. Uh, Charnel, um, in terms of uh, you know frequency. Um, where, where did you land on and why in terms of um, how often you wanted to have staff uh, trained? Yeah, it's, as far as frequency, um, I put them in two buckets. Like you have your standard regular trainings that I believe should happen monthly, which is what I rolled out for an organization. Um, for specialized trainings that uh, occur, should there be like changes in your contract requirements? Because some folks get uh, government contracts and have certain requirements they have to follow um, or their state law expectations for them on um, how they're maintaining records and uh, keeping cyber cyber security and data. Um, so should those changes occur, uh, just having some specialized trainings as well, focus on that. Um, I'm an advocate that trainings in general shouldn't be one off. Um, also, as far as a frequency, I will say that it also depends on the industry because um, there are different data uh, management expectations. So I always encourage companies or clients I'm working with uh, to review what their document retention requirements are. So you're really like taking the time looking at that uh, data lifecycle, how long you should be keeping those documents, um, that retention, destruction of the information at the end of that life cycle, making sure that that happens in a certain manner and it is coupled with uh, whatever security trainings that you're doing for your particular company. And also I do think it's important for uh, organizations to really plan uh, who has access to what and for what purpose, right? So you don't want to give a vendor or there are certain people in the organization that uh, don't need access to certain data. Uh, you wanna make sure that uh, if there's certain things you wanna limit, they are limited to certain people. Um, so just making sure that those trainings really reinforce that, um, and they're also really in line in how you're structuring whatever program you use. Great, that's, that's great. And and Carlton, any, any uh, additional thoughts there on on how you landed on the frequency um, for the training for your organization? Yeah. So no before has a uh, every year they come out with a new version of their training. Um, as far as uh, phishing tests go. Um, so we have uh, staff are required to take that annually. And then um, for the remedial training, if someone fails the phishing test, I mean, they have to take that every time they click on it. So um, they usually learn pretty quick. 
um, not to start clicking on things. Uh, but we see that usually with new hires and then, you know, it just gradually goes away. But um, the annual training is about 45 minutes, 45 minutes long. And then the remedial training is about 15 minutes. And then um, for both of those trainings, there's a, there's a little test in between in the middle of the training to verify that they actually took the training. And Carlton, I, you know, for the people that are on, could you talk a little bit about, so, you know, in terms of the system that's in place, you know, uh, is there, how do you see who's taken the training, who hasn't, who's failed the phishing test? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I get a, a, a weekly report of who's failed the, the remedial training. Um, and then I also get a report every week of like, okay, this person um, hasn't started the training at all, or maybe a new employee has started and they haven't started their uh, initial um, training. So I get a weekly report of that. And then um, I don't have the setup. You can set it up to where, um, let's say after two weeks, they haven't taken it. And then their manager gets an email and you can set up to maybe another week later then. Um, the executive director gets an email. We don't, we don't have that set up because we don't, we haven't had that issue, but uh, you can automate it to where it does that. And we send out phishing tests on a monthly basis. So um, I, I find it pretty quick who's clicking through. Great. So if you, you know, on the screen at, you know, in terms of frequency, right, I have monthly, quarterly, biannual, annual. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, with understanding, with all the work and all the other training that staff have to do, you know, committing staff to monthly is a challenge. But you know, I think it's it's something. Um, you know, this this training should be taken serious. Uh, there is a lot of 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 you know content to cover, right? So so one training, whether it's 15 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, it really is sort of difficult to capture all that. Um, in one training. So, you know, having multiple trainings, you know, sort of throughout the year um, is, is definitely, um, you know, the, the way to go. Um, but, you know, at, at minimum, you've got to do annual, but, you know, hopefully you're able to do, um, you know, something that's, that's more frequent. Okay, so, um, you know, how, how, how to make this uh, a success, right? So, so what are some of the, the ways, you know, so the, for the people that are listening now that are, you know, thinking about it or, or, or saying, or joining because, hey, you know, um, I've heard about, you know, security awareness training, um, you know, is it something that I should do? Why, why is it important? Um, but, you know, talking a little bit about how to make it a success, um, you know, Carlton, you had mentioned um, and I think Charnel as well, you know, buy-in from, from upper management. Could you, I guess, talk, Carlton, a little bit about why you think that's important? Yeah, you know, um, usually with these types of projects, I, I ask for the funding, and if I get it for the project, then on something like this, I go straight to the executive director and just say, hey, are we, do we have buy-in on this? Are you guys, guys going to help me implement this by making a, a priority? Because um, if you don't have buy-in from upper management, then you're never going to get it rolled out. Because if, if employees find out they don't have to do it, they're not going to do it. So um, right. it just makes my job a lot easier, rolling it out and implementing it and then you know, enforcing it. Right. And then so on, on focus training, Tim, I'm going to um, look to you on this. What So... Can, I guess, can you talk a little bit about what focus training means and, and how uh, an organization could think about that? Yes, yeah, so I think Carlton touched on it a little bit with the kind of assessment and just kind of looking at Nova 4 as an example, but uh, I'm sure other platforms have it as well. Uh, you can have like an, an entire company-wide assessment that you can send out and get, just get a feel for where your company is kind of better at and where you're maybe need some training on. And you can kind of use those assessments as uh, that you send out that each um, employee would take to kind of focus on the trainings that you want to kind of push out to people as a whole, as a whole company, 
And then there's also trains that you can push out that are kind of individual to based on people's roles. So if you have CEOs, you can have trainings that push out to CEOs and executive directors, as well as uh, HR and financing. You can have certain trainings that might be geared towards them as well. Um, and kind of the automation can tie into that as well, because you can have automation towards the focus groups where you set up certain groups and then you have trainings that just get pushed out to those particular groups that kind of focus on uh, as a whole on the, uh, the position that they are in uh, for the for the company. Right. So anyone that's looking into different solutions, I would definitely ask about, um, you know, do they have focus training? Because I, I think that is important because it's, you know, it's not a one, not, not to say it's not a one size fits all, right? But the, there's some trainings that are better suited for specific staff. So as an example, you know, I touched on earlier, um, you know, sending a fake invoice. Well, you know, there are trainings that, you know, sort of talk about the different ways that, um, you know, phishing tests, uh, phishing attempts and, and other uh, ways that they try to get, you know, target fiscal staff. So that that's going to help, um, uh, you know, train, you know, targeted training uh, focused on on your fiscal staff uh, to be aware of that. You know, not to say that that wouldn't necessarily be helpful for other staff to do it as well, um, because maybe you know, do you have uh, other attorneys that are dealing with vouchers or you know reimbursements? Um, but you know, having uh, you know focused training, I think. Um, you know, really adds to, you know, the training sort of platform. Um, and, it, and it's not just, uh, you know, one training or the same training that's, you know, sort of taken across the board. Um, I think that's, that's definitely important. Carlton, can you talk a little bit about the, the automation piece? Um, when, when we spoke, you, you brought that up um, as a way to sort of you know, you, you've got a lot of other work to do, right? You want this to be a success, you want this to happen, um, but using automation to help, you know, keep things running with, with you know, you know, somewhat minimal work, um, you know, helps, uh, you know, to make sure things get done. I guess, can you talk a little bit about how you've um, used automation to help with your program? Yeah, I think I touched on a little bit earlier too. It's, um, we only have three people in our, uh, IT group. We've got 160 employees, so we're all you know running around crazy all day, just trying to uh, put the fires out. So I think automation is really important when you're trying to um, do something like this because uh, it's impossible to keep up with. You know, is this is this person doing the training or they're not doing the training? Those weekly emails just give me a, an insight into what's going on, so it's a lot easier for me to look at and go. Oh, this is the second time I've gotten notice on this person. They either didn't get the original email, they deleted it, or they just forgot about the training. So um, even though they get emails from you know, before, so anyway, it's it's just uh, it's easier for me um, to manage it if I have automation set up to where it automatically sends out emails and helps me enforce um, some of these training, like remedial training. Gotcha. Yeah. No, I mean, three, three staff uh, for, for as many users as you have. I mean, and anything that you could use to keep things going um, without your involvement um, is, is definitely helpful. And I'm sure there's a lot of organizations on this call that's in a, a similar boat, right? How do I get this implemented? And now, you know, I've got to do this every week, every month. Like, you know, how am I supposed to do it? But You've, you've sort of touched on something that, you know, hopefully they'll, they'll think about, right? Using the automation, you know, spend a little bit of time to get that set up, but then it's, it's doing a lot of the work um, on its own. So, you know, definitely something that's uh, important um, when, when looking at, at, at different solutions. Um, and the nice thing about know before too is that they have really good salespeople. I mean, they'll, they'll contact me and say, hey, Carlton, I noticed that, uh, this one training campaign you have, it's about to expire. Do you want to, we have new trainings that are coming out for that. Do you want to switch over to the new training? Do you want to let this one run out? What do you want to do with that? So, and they're there to help that, you know, I'll get on a call with them. They'll walk me through 
whatever it is that, uh, that needs attention. Um, and it's usually like a 15 minute call and get it set up or fix whatever it is. Um, you don't typically get that with most, most companies now. You have to call tech support and, you know, I need help with this and you're on hold for 30 minutes, but these guys, they're, they're really stay on top of it. Right, right. So Sean, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, throw the last couple your way because um, they, I think to some degree they sort of all tie in, right? So the onboarding, you know, the reinforcement and supervision, um, you know, any, you know, with, with having implemented, um, you know, any sort of tips there that you have to share, um, you know, on, on the onboarding. And, you know, I guess what I'm sort of thinking about is, you know, so that initial sort of process to get people on, but then you also have to worry about the new staff starting after, right, um, before it was implemented. And then, you know, with the reinforcement and supervision, you know, any tips on how you sort of, you know, keep that going? Yeah. Um, as far as onboarding, I think the uh, buy-in from the managers is the key component because uh, you want to make sure that you have the cyber policies drafted and ready um, for staff when they're coming in. Um, you, you'll be able to communicate to staff early on. These are our cyber procedures. Uh, this is what's in place. This is the responsibilities that you have. And um, with my experience working with a lot of uh, legal service organizations, you know, attorneys have a legal obligation and a professional responsibility to manage client data properly. Um, so really emphasizing that component. Uh, whenever you draft these policies, making sure that they're present in your employee manuals, right? And so you want to make sure it's really outlined for them. If they have any questions, they're able to talk to either executive team, their manager, or HR. Um, also, I suggest that folks uh, draft incident response procedures. Um, I like to put these in line with, for anyone that lives in New York and had to uh, really draft a COVID response plan is similar to that. Um, you're really drafting a document that's going to provide your staff with guidance on what they should do or who they should be in contact with should there be any type of incident. Um, you're just planning out and identifying what cyber events could happen, different scenarios and the appropriate responses. Um, and in those guidance and tips, you give them who's the response team, what are the reporting requirements. Um, whenever they're initiating that initial response to that breach, making sure that they're following those procedures and having a proper investigation. Um, also, you wanna make sure that you're talking to your tech team, if it's internal, external, um, whatever recovery and follow-up procedures you need to follow. And then something that's really key for the management team is making sure that if that breach is leaking out uh, extremely confidential information and you know it gets to the media or anything related to that, uh, there's a communications and public relations plan. And um, for states that do have those data breach laws, um, just making sure that that notice requirement is met. So um, if you have to reach out to certain state regulators, so the AG, sometimes you have to reach out to law enforcement, depending on what type of cyber insurance you have uh, for your company, you have to actually reach out directly um, to your funders or uh, to your clients that were impacted by the issue. Um, so just really reinforcing that in all of the procedures you're presenting to folks. Um, also, as far as maintenance, um, you wanna make sure that you're providing folks the equipment checkout forms is what I usually uh, call them. You're drafting documents so you're able to track internally who has certain devices within your organization. Uh, so they understand that they have a responsibility to maintain the equipment a certain way. Um, and also you're able to conduct that analysis internally um, do we have remote device management procedures in place? So if someone loses a device, is your tech team able to easily just wipe that information off that device? So just having those steps and make sure it's communicated to all your staff across the board. That's great. That's great, great information, Sean. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, Tim, I'm gonna throw a couple of, of your way. Um, the any so any tips on um, the the phishing test that you would uh, you know sort of suggest? I mean, 
I think this is part of um, making a success. I mean, you know, we have, you know, limited uh, space on, on, on the slide, but um, I wanted to sort of touch on that. I mean, what, what are some of the things that you think uh, can make the fishing tests, uh, you know, more, more beneficial to the organization? Uh, yeah, I think you can, uh, I mean, you have different options and it may vary through some platforms where, uh, I mean, you can send a phishing test where it's from the same sender and it all goes out right at, all at once. And what ha typically happens there is, uh, well, more often if people were in the office, but still happens through Teams and, and other chat systems where one person gets it and they start notifying the other person and it goes through the entire um, company that this phishing email came through and it doesn't really do the same effect um, that it would if it was unique. Um, so a lot of times we recommend to send out a phishing campaign that is uh, scattered between multiple senders and also has different uh, body messages uh, that in different categories so that it's unique to the person that gets it so that it will actually truly test them on what um, what they're looking for when the emails come in and, and just kind of no, noticing that it's from someone that they've never contacted before. Uh, and also just kind of scattering it out. So I mentioned the sending it all at once. You could send it between like a three day period. You could send it through a whole week period. And then you can also set the time frame of like throughout the day, it could come at night So really, uh, a lot of these platforms have flexibility as to how you want to send it and to really kind of get a, a gauge and a test if people will, uh, uh, employees will fall for, for these, uh, for the phishing email. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, re it's really good advice to when, when doing the test to scatter it out over time. So it doesn't go out to all staff at once. And if you have the ability to send different emails, um, out as well, so not everyone's getting the same one. Um, helps, you know, get get more out of those phishing attempts, attempts uh, or tests uh, than than you would if, if sending out to the same one. Um, another thing I wanted to, and I, I think I touched on it a, a little bit. Um, so the, you know, for the online training platforms, they do have, um, you know, there's a, a library of of, uh, of material. Um, and, you know, some are just videos that you watch, right? There's, there's nothing more to do than, than just watch it. And they also have some that are interactive where you're watching and then you have, to, you have to answer some questions or maybe you answer, you have to answer some questions first. And then depending upon what you select, um, it, you know, it'll show you, uh, you know, the, a video that's appropriate. So, you know, I think just um, watching a, a video, you know, all the time, um, you know, doesn't go as far as as one that's that's interactive. So I, you know, definitely, you know, having a solution that that could do that, I think, is is helpful. I think you'll get more more out of the platform um, as well. Um, trying to uh, keep track of time here, so three forty seven. So doing doing pretty good on time, uh, looking through some of the questions that I have. Um, anyone on the panel, so outside of what we've talked about um, to make this a success, any, any other thoughts or suggestions that you think would be helpful for our, our audience to, to be aware of? Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the nice things about the training, you know, everybody's super busy. Um, if they start the training, they can always come back later and finish it. They don't have to watch the entire video again. So that's that's really helpful. And you were talking about online training versus live training before. I mean, even before COVID, we had a really hard time um, getting people together for live training. We have uh, um, advocates and attorneys that travel the state all the time. Um, so it's really hard to pin them down for training. So, I mean, the online training was really the only option for us and it's, it's worked out really well that's good good advice uh carlton A anyone else um uh just uh while we're sort of on that yeah i'd say for the uh automation piece i mean a lot of these platforms will integrate with um 
G Suite, now uh, Google Workspace or Office 365. So you can really integrate them. Users can be imported automatically as part of the automation, as well as new people that are onboarded as they're added in, they'll automatically get assigned over to the platform and then assigned the training that they're supposed to start with. So that just ties into the automation process of new people coming in and it's just less for uh, you have to kind of remember to do it, just confirming that they show up in the portal and then they're good to go. Great. Yeah, that's, that's definitely good to know. I mean, again, it ties into what Carlton said earlier. You know, you're busy doing a lot of other things, even though this is important, um, doesn't mean that more time is going to be added to your day. So, you know, whatever um, you're able to do in an automated fashion to, to help, uh, you know, to help the process, I think is, is going to be welcome. Um, so um, in terms of cost and implementation, um, the prices really do vary. Um, I definitely suggest, um, you know, to look at more than one um, platform. I think, you know, the, the, probably the most known and common yes, is no yes. before. Um, and, you know, the, each one of these um, options uh, have different packages. Um, the cost depends on, you know, uh, per user per year uh, based off of um, how many users you have. So, um, I try to put in the high end of, of the cost um, and, and then say or less because a lot depends on how many users you have and then also what package uh, you select. I think, if, you know, if you if you uh, think back uh, to this video, um, uh, this webinar and and, you know, think about some of the things we touched on and making sure that, you know, the solution that you end up going with, whether it be one of these or you know uh, another solution that you've been uh, made aware of or or told about um you know I, I think you're in, you're in good hands if if you you know if you're able to cover uh check a lot of the boxes on on you know sort of what we've um picked about i included um uh, ngo because um partly because at the beginning of the pandemic they actually offered um the legal um uh, nonprofit community um, free, uh, I think it was like three months or six months uh, worth of, uh, of training. It, it was a limited um, access to, to the uh, library, but, but they did offer it for free, um, which I thought was, you know, was, was great on their part. And they have, um, you know, good content. Um, if, uh, you know, in terms of implementation costs, it really sort of, um, depends on so one is like the cost here is if you're you know outsourcing uh, you know the the implementation of it if you've got internal it staff um you know like someone smart like carlton where you know you're doing it in-house um you know you don't have to necessarily worry about these costs but the the implementation cost really does vary because um there are a lot of things that you could do i mean you could do a pretty basic setup, right? You know, pick a couple, you know, pick one or, or, or you know, a, a few trainings, you know, get people, um, you know, accounts, you know, send out an email and say, hey, you know, these are the, the trainings that you've, you've got to complete. Uh, but then when you get a little bit more into the automation where you're doing the phishing tests and you have that um, going out and, and you have um, your solution integrated with Active Directory or Office 365, uh, like Tim mentioned, you know, there's there's more work involved there. So the implementation cost really varies depending upon um, how much you know uh, you you want to sort of do upfront. Um, I think when possible, you know, think about the long term solution and and you know do as much as you can upfront. Um, so then it's it's less work um, down the road. But but yeah, these these are some solutions you could look into. But they're are definitely a lot more out there, um, and and again the price the pricing uh, varies. You know the one thing that you know that that's common is you know there's an annual uh, per user cost um, you know that that you're you're paying for. Hey Michael, I mean I'd also ask uh, whoever better you go with to find out what is included. I mean maybe the implementation is included in there. Cost that you're paying. 
Yeah, no, uh, definitely. Um, there are some, some solutions that, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do some of the implementation. Um, I mean, the, you'll, you'll end up being sort of involved um, in that because there are, you know, decisions that they can't make for you. You've got to, you know, you've got to sort of answer those um, uh, for you. But yeah, d definitely worth, um, yeah, uh, yeah, talking to them about implementation and seeing if that's something that, the, you know, they're willing to include or can do or, you know, if you've got to find someone. Because there are some solutions where they only sell to um, MSPs, um, uh, so you'd have to get it through them. Uh, the ones I've listed, uh, you know, on the previous slide, I mean, those you're able to, you know, to get directly or through through an MSP, um, you know, if, uh, you know, if, if, if you like. Um, so I forgot this this next slide um, was coming, but yeah, in terms of when when shopping around, I mean, you know, these are the you know these are some of the things to sort of look for. You know, the automation, you know, a good you know library of trainings, the interactive options, you know, that they update update their content, you know, annually, um, if you know if, if not more more frequently, you know, especially if um, you know there's a new sort of type of threat. Um, that you need, uh, you know, to alert staff about, you know, the reporting and monitoring options, and you know, also the phishing tests. So, you know, these are all options that you know you should really look at. Um, you know, making sure that the solution that uh, you go with um, has these. Okay, so um, we've talked a lot about, um, uh, you know. The, the training on the why, the different um, ways that uh, uh, you could get, um, you know, uh, attacked, um, you know, the, why they sort of they do it, what you should look at for a solution, what are the different solutions, uh, you know, in, include and, and do. Um, so here we, we just, you know, with, uh, we, we've got a couple minutes, um, wanted to just touch on some other um, security uh, related items that you should be thinking about that's, you know, not necessarily part of, of training, um, but that's either, um, you know, going to be um, basically, uh, you know, required to do either by funders or, or by um, your insurance company, um, like Charnel mentioned earlier. Um, and, you know, for those of you that are filling out, um, you know, the grant applications and the renewals, you're seeing every year more and more, there's more security related questions that are on there. Um, and, you know, as I was mentioning to Carlton um, before this call started, you know, that's that's how it starts, right? First, it's, it's asking, hey, are you doing this? You know, what are you doing for that? And then, you know, as time goes on, those, those what are you doing becomes more, you know, more times than not required. Right, so and then it goes from from if you're doing it to, you know, what are you using? What are you using for MFA? What's what's your VPN product? Um, what are you using for for email security? Um, so, uh, Carlton, you um, are actually today. Congratulations, um, have uh, you know MFA installed? Um, do you want to just touch uh, real quickly on on what it does and 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 why you implemented it? Yeah, so multi-factor authentication uh, basically provides a second level of security when you're checking your email or accessing office.com. Um, so you basically type in your username and password, and then you have to have a second form of authentication, whether it's a security token or uh, an app on your phone. Um, and then, you know, then you have access. Um, we... Uh, my plan was to do MFA with just Office 365 in 2022, but I found out about a month ago from our cyber insurance provider that they are requiring MFA on <clears throat> anybody who has an email address. If you're accessing servers or web applications, so um, they basically gave us a 60-day reprieve to get all this set up. So. That's that's where I'm at right now. I've got to the end of this month to get all of that uh, in place. I've got, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got 
110 people set up with MFA right now. Got 50, yeah, 50 people to go. So um, it's not been a fun five weeks or so. <laughs> Um, I'll say to have uh, two, only two months to do it and, and you're uh, more than halfway through is, is pretty impressive. So congrats to you. That's 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 very impressive. Thanks. And, then, you know, that was another instance where I, had to, you know, actually, I didn't have to do anything. The executive director came to me and said, I know we got to do this. So <clears throat> whatever you need, whatever help you need from me, let me know. So she's been super supportive and and actually all the employees have been supportive as well because they know the situation we're in. Great. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, uh, so a VPN, you know, virtual private network. Um, so that um, basically secures your connection, um, you know, from outside um, into your network. Um, that's just becoming, um, you know, basically standard practice. Because um, if you don't have that, um, you know, basically your server that because you're you're allowing staff to connect you know to your resources your network resources and if you don't have that um you know basically you know they're they're considering that as being open to the outside world um so you know that that's just again some another uh, security item that's becoming more and more um you know standard sort of practice uh to do um, Tim, do you want to um, talk a little bit about um, and you know briefly because uh, we're at four o'clock um, email security? Yeah, there's definitely a decent amount of platforms. There's um, uh, just even with no before they have like a, a fish ER portal that basically when you uh, uh, submit a phishing email that or an email that you think is phishing, it will report it and then can be analyzed and there's other platforms out there that, that are similar through Microsoft 365 that you can link through as well as Google uh, Workspace. Um, and a lot of times they'll have um, kind of uh, machine learning and AI that's kind of reviewing your mailboxes and trying to pick out the bad ones. But there's also on the user side uh, that it, it has that fish alert, uh, fish reporting button so you can report it, and those reporting options will work differently for the platform that you may that you may try. But they'll have options where it will actually display uh, some details before submitting it, kind of showing you okay what to look for, possibilities of what they think is uh, why it might be phishing or why it might not be, especially if it's a sender that's never sent to you before. Um, uh, yeah, so there's definitely some uh, some great tools out there that help kind of filter the uh, uh, the the emails and help protect. Uh, and none of them will be perfect, and which is also why the security training aspect is is a huge to kind of go alongside that. Um, but they they definitely can help uh, thin out some of the some of the obvious ones. Right. Yeah. What I what I'll sort of add to that is. You know, so email security goes beyond um, just, you know, the, your standard, um, you know, spam filter. Um, it, it, it does more. Um, so one, one sort of example, depending upon the solution that you have, um, you know, let's say in, in, in a phishing email is sent out, right? It's, you know, someone's account has been compromised and that account is being used to then mail, you know, email everybody that they, they have, that they have in their address book, plus any other emails that they add, um, you know, that email sent out. Initially, it, you know, it's just another email, right? It, it, no one knows that it's, you know, it's, it's a malicious email um, until it sort of gets flagged. And, you know, one of the things that um, these email security platforms are able to do is, even though an email has bypassed, um, once it's sort of flagged as as a you know a malicious email, um, you you could you know manually go through some of them um, could do it sort of automated, um, and what I mean by manual is you know you could do a search for that email so you know one user has received that email, and you you do a search through all of your organization's mailboxes, you could see exactly who's received it, and then you could delete it from everyone's. Uh, mailbox. There are some platforms that once you tag it as a malicious email, 
um, there's an automated process that it does it on its own, right? It just, it does a search for you. It, it pulls that email out um, because that way, um, you know, someone who hasn't read it, you know, they won't even have a chance mm -hmm. um, to see that email and potentially, um, you know, fall for that. Um, so, you know, that's, a, a, you know, sort of a, a few reasons why um, email security you know, is something that you should think about as well. Um, okay, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a sec. Um, there are some uh, posts in the chat um, that I wanted to try to uh, get to to see. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so so Eric, um, I see that. What are the costs for the online training? Um, so there was a slide, um, you know, that that has. Uh, um, you know, uh, that has some, some basic information on the cost. Uh, again, um, you know, it really depends on the package that you select, you know, just think of like the, you know, so the bronze, silver, gold, you know, uh, some of them include more training, some of them less, some of them, uh, you know, include more automation, some of them include like what Tim mentioned, the fish ER solution. So really, um, you know, depends on on the package that you you pick. But you know, I gave that slide that that kind of gives you an idea um, on the higher end. You know, I, I think you know what what those costs uh, vary. Um, and then uh, Liza Rosa, I see. Yeah, um, you 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 posted that question as well about um, you know, do you have some companies or, or uh, for cybersecurity? Um, so I hope um, that was helpful. Um, so, you know, we want to open it up. Does, is there anyone that, um, you know, you could either chat um, or, um, you know, you could, you could type it in the chat box. Is there any questions that we could, we could help um, answer for you? Um, so uh, someone's uh, asking where, where, where would you rank advanced, uh, advanced endpoint protection um so uh so endpoint protection uh allison is is a little bit different um than what we've uh, been talking about um so uh we've been talking you know more focus on 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 email and you know what comes through with you know links and attachments and and you know the training around that um uh advanced um endpoint protection that's more focused on your machine um, itself. So, you know, think of the antivirus that's installed on your computer um, and, uh, and, and how, you know, your computer is, is checked. Um, I mean, you know, one of the more, um, you know, popular ones right now, um, and, you know, unfortunately, um, a lot of the top tier um, solutions aren't cheap is, um, is Checkpoint. Um, because of all you know the, the databases that it used, the engineers that they have on 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 their end, um, you know monitoring um, uh, and and you know keeping the, the database updated. So when there's new you know types of threats, um, uh, uh, you know that uh, you know it's it's searching for that. Um, it you know can also do things where you know it's searching for sus suspicious activity that is you know potentially on your computer so you know uh you know think of ransomware and it starts you know um encrypting your files and you know it's it's looking for things like that um so i hope um allison i i at first when i read it i thought you might have uh meant advanced threat protection which is the you know office 365 um email um you know email security system and um you know if you were um discussing that um I, I think advanced threat protection is a good solution to have in place if you know if, if that's all that you could do um but if you if you've got a, a little bit more of a budget i would definitely look at some other options out there um but 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 really good um question i hope i hope you know one of those two answers answered that if, if not please chat um uh, thank you, Allison. A anyone else have any um, questions? You know, you could unmute yourself. You could, you know, put it in chat. We're we're 
we're here to, to an, help answer any questions that you have. Okay. All right, no, seems like no questions, which is okay. Um, no problem, Allison. Again, I hope uh, I hope one of those two answered uh, helped you. Um, I guess, uh, so if there are no questions, uh, any additional questions, any, any last minute thoughts from the panel? Carlton, I'll just start with you first. I see you first, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I would, uh, I would start implementing things that, that come with your, if you have Office 365, it comes with two-factor authentication. So um, if you sign up with them after 2018, it's already enabled by default. But if you sign up before then, um, you just go in and enable it. You can enable it for all your users, or just a small group of them. Um, but I would start there with the, you know, the things you can do right now without, with no cost. That's good. Yeah, good, good, good advice. I mean, again, um, if, if, uh, like you said, if you, you have it, you, you have it in place already, it doesn't, you know, unfortunately that only protects you for office 365, you know, doesn't protect you, you know, for remote access or, you know, other ways that you might have to log in. Um, you know, doesn't for uh, your case management system, but um, for anyone using legal server, legal server now has MFA, you know, uh, built in, um, and they also, um, you know, tie into certain uh, multi-factor authentications like Okta um, as well. Um, so, you know, you're able to protect your case management system as well. Uh, Chanel, any, any last last words of advice or, or wisdom from you? I would definitely suggest that uh, folks conduct a risk assessment. Um, when you do those assessments, it'll help you plan and implement uh, whatever cybersecurity program you're gonna roll out. And also, if you do not have cybersecurity insurance, I suggest you look into that. Um, if you are a firm, uh, a legal service provider, a lot of the malpractice insurance uh, folks will provide uh, cyber coverage. You just need to talk to them and see what type of plan coverages that they have for you, but make sure you get the insurance coverage. Great. And yeah, good, great. Actually, we, we should have added the insurance to our other things to think about as well. So I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad you, you brought that up. Um, we should have added that to that slide. So thank you. Uh, Tim, any, any last words uh, of advice for those that are, are with us? Yeah, I mean, I think the uh, just overall um, education on the end users and just in a way, and I think the platforms do it in a way that's not trying to shame people or make them feel like they don't know what they're doing. I think that a lot of times it's beneficial where you can actually just learn and have an understanding that you're working with your company to help protect it better while and learning at the same time, which I think is, is great. And I think just kind of echoing the MFA, I mean, they have, platforms like Duo and Okta that can really tie into multiple platforms all into one MFA. Um, but like Colton was saying, I mean, if you wanted to push forward with something right away and you have G Suite uh, or Google Workspace or you have Office 365, there's a lot of MFA that you can just deploy uh, right away. And kind of with that MFA, I would just encourage making sure you have uh, decent password policies in place. Um, to make sure that there's no uh, easy uh, guessable passwords as well. Great, great. Okay, I'm just making sure I didn't miss any questions. Um, so, uh, Liza, I, actually, I, uh, Liza Rosa, I see your question now sort of for some reason it wasn't showing completely. Um, 
so you, you asked, you know, do you have some uh, companies or cybersecurity consultants you could recommend for nonprofits? Um, uh, so with with so Tim and I work for Just Tech. We do a lot of work with nonprofits, um, but I, I don't, you know, this isn't a, a sales call. So what what I would do? So LSN Tap is a great resource um, for um, posting, you know, these kind of great questions. And you've got people like Carlton, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call. You've got you know people um, from the community that are very active. Um, on those on on LSN tap listserv, um, so uh, Liza, that that would be a great question um, to post within LSN tap because you're going to get a lot of different um, responses from people. Um, so you know, uh, I, I think you know that that would be a good a good place um, to go to you know for the for the question that that you have. All right, well. We have utilized all but one minute of uh, of the time. Um, I, I really want to thank uh, Chardonnay and Carlton for, for joining us on this panel. Um, definitely appreciate all the work that you do within the community. Uh, appreciate you know you're bringing your knowledge and expertise here and and sharing that. You know, I think that's that's how we work together, right? Um, I, I hope that we've uh, you know spoke about and answered questions that help people take those next steps to what they, you know, um, you know, should be thinking about uh, or thinking about doing. And hopefully we've made that a little bit easier for them um, uh, to do um, and, and be able to take the next steps. So thank you everyone for joining. I really hope uh, this was helpful um, on this, on this uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more LSN tap trainings, um, you know, that are, uh, you know, coming up. So, you know, please look at the at the website for upcoming events. And um, I hope everyone uh, enjoys the rest of the day. Thank you, everybody.